Yeah, I mean, really. And, and, and I know some of you had to look through the flowers that are there and, and to be reminded of, of even what Glenn has pushed through uh, over these uh, last, uh, it, it wasn't even 10 days, uh, seeing him in one place and seeing him in another and knowing that he's seeing us this morning in such an amazing way. But, but I think even this morning, and it was interesting the conversation in adult ed this morning of just that, you know, we talk about, um, and, and some of you may have pushed through this kind of thing, the black knight, that, that point in your life, uh, in, in, in mental health circles we talk about the black knight of the soul. There are these moments when people come to a place in their journey of faith where they feel like they've been totally abandoned. And so this morning, you know, we're pushing through, this is the fourth week uh, of our conversation centered around this movie called Risen. Um, and I, I can finally tell you that we've seen it and I can hardly endorse your seeing it in terms of the telling of the story, in terms of the honoring of the biblical narrative. It's got some fictional elements to it, but really um, to, to push into seeing the story from a first century Roman centurion and then understanding his journey of trying to find out in the midst of, of chaos, of political chaos, uh, not much unlike our own day, right? Um, just the messiness of the world that we find ourselves in. Uh, and so this morning, uh, I want us to look at a particular way of looking at the resurrection. So if you have your worship notes, you might want to get them out. Um, because I, I want to go back, actually, in uh, uh, 2001, Sports Illustrated did a, uh, a magazine, a story, an essay, about uh, the greatest, the top ten greatest comebacks in history. And they talked about uh, Muhammad Ali. They talked about some non-sports things like Germany and Japan both made the list as combat nations after World War II. Uh, and, but what was extraordinary to me was the number one article, number one thing of com comeback was the, his, the story of Jesus' resurrection. So here you have a sports magazine that's very much a secular magazine, uh, and yet they said that the number one comeback in history was the fact that Jesus confounded his critics and stunned the Roman authorities with his resurrection. And that's a quote from the article. And so you'll see there on your handout, uh, worship notes, uh, the first scripture I sort of point us to, and the thing I want us to hang around this morning and walk around a little bit is this idea that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So in those moments when we sit, uh, as the men did with, as we actually stood around Glenn uh, Burley's bedside, and Glenn obviously was not there, but as we offered our presence to Charlene Reed and, and Scott, his uh, caregivers there, um, and uh, Charlene's son came in, Caleb, a young man, um, yeah, it, it's the tension of that. And that's why what we do matters. And so I was humbled that, that the men were there, that I don't even Glenn planned it that way. I don't know how these things work in our last moments, but the idea that we could come and be part of his family and offer that support is, uh, Charlene was just pushing through, what all does this mean? Um, but let me pray for us, and then I want us to look at some things from the perspective of the Gospels this morning. Father, we are grateful for life. Uh, we celebrate the fact of the truth of the life that Jesus, you are the resurrection. And yet we know that many of us, even today maybe, just the idea of losing an hour's sleep, that there is this, uh, we're living in Friday. And, and I want us, as we push through the story, to be reminded in a different way but in a very clear way that Sunday's come, that the truth of Sunday is there, and no matter what we tend to have to push into, whatever it may be, and however messy and complicated it is, and whatever it may cost us, is that, that there is the truth of the resurrection. And so as your people, we want to hang on to that this morning. So, Father, send your Holy Spirit to guide us, to encourage us. Thank you for the reminder, Jesus, of, of just all that you are, even through the choral anthem that the choir uh, shared with us. But as we turn our hearts to you and to your word, and as we look at your scriptures, may your Holy Spirit enlighten us. May you take the words that I've, I've penned and lay them aside in a sense of really taking what it is that you want us to understand on this day uh, as we go forth as your people. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I want us to look at this first. So, and you'll, you'll notice there's a theme through everything I've been taking us through since uh, arriving here is just coming to the Bible at a different direction to help give you a different sense of what the Bible is all about. And so this morning we're going to look at uh, the four gospel writers. We're going to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I want you to see that each one of the gospels has its own place. Um, and so Matthew, his focus is really about the Jewish nation or religious people, the religious leaders of the day. 
And so he really spent time focusing on Jesus' credentials. That's why if you read the first chapter of Matthew, I love that book, that chapter of that book, because it goes through the whole genealogy. And he takes and walks through and shows that in Jesus' lineage is somebody like Rahab the harlot, Rahab the prostitute. And that how through, uh, through messy lives, God accomplishes the story, which is the takeaway for us this morning. Uh, the, the takeaway of, even as some of us shared yesterday, of hearing Glenn's story, that there was a point where Glenn had a real issue with alcohol. And his life was completely a wreck from what we were told. And yet it's clear after a conversation with Pastor Kress from this congregation who sat down with him, we don't know what that conversation was, it was a conversation that changed Glenn's life radically. Uh, actually, I shared a picture that Charlene gave me that's in my office. It's a different picture of Jesus than I've ever seen. But saying that when Glenn became a member of this church and had that conversation, that picture went up on his wall and was there you know, through the rest of his life. And so it's in those moments of being, you know, sort of engaging Jesus. And so Jesus, through his written word, through the scriptures, we see what Matthew does. And then Mark, Mark actually is a very pragmatic kind of guy. So he addressed the Romans, who were very pragmatic people. And what he really did is Mark spent a lot of time focusing on Jesus' actions. And then we get to Luke, who was a physician. And Luke, of course, went after the Greeks. And why? Because the Greeks were thinkers. Um, and so he, he brought out Jesus' tension, uh, teachings in a very specific way. And then John, and John's the one that I also love too, because he always comes at it from a different direction. So if you have a moment today or later this week, you know, look at the first chapter of each of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And notice that in John, that it's radically different, that we really don't get the historical narrative. And what we get is you know, it opens up, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And it's just interesting, that tension that John, because he has this whole different perspective he wants to bring. And so each of us, then, each of these writers, give us a reason why Christ's resurrection matters. So I want to ask you a question. How, how can something that happened 2,000 years ago impact our life today? Now, what does the resurrection have to do with your life, with my life? And can the resurrection actually impact it? So let's look at, at Matthew. Matthew, sort of, here's the perspective he offers. He says simply this, I can come back from despair. And that's important because when, like we take the conversation most recently with, with Glenn's family of walking through this, of losing a, a loved one. And I know there are others of you that this week, you know, push through the similar kind of things in your own way with, with family members and friends. I mean, it's just incredible to me that, that because of the resurrection, that we can, in those moments, when we are in the dark night of our soul, we can come back from that. I mean, if you think about it, I, I really think all you have to do is watch TV in the last you know, 48 hours to see that there are a lot of people struggling with hopelessness, they're struggling with despair, they're struggling with deep discouragement, uh, they're asking, how do you bounce back in this culture? How do you bounce back in this economy? How do you bounce back from losing your house? How do you bounce back from losing a marriage? How do you bounce back from losing a loved one? How do you bounce back from a broken relationship with your children? How do you bounce back from losing someone you deeply cared about? In other words, how do you bounce back? How do you move from where you are in despair to a sense of encouragement? Uh, I mean, in America especially, we think that we can solve that through a political process. And although we do need civil government, that's not the answer. And we also know that, that as I saw a couple weeks ago, a uh, presentation by uh, Mayor Glenn Stewart in Ashland. He used to work at General Motors. And he talked about how they invested uh, back in the 1980s uh, over $600 million in this press. And the, and the extraordinary efforts they good, got, went through to get down the St. Lawrence Seaway into uh, the lake system and trying to get here. And the locks froze up and, and, and at Erie, and so there was this messiness, and they had, you know, didn't matter what it cost, and they brought out these amazing trucks with amazing wheels and moved it through. And yet, the tension of that is you drive out past the mall, there's just a big pad of concrete, and that's about it. And you think about what would $600 million have done? So we think that these things, and, and companies now make decisions very quickly of just moving from one place to the other because it's all about the bottom line. 
And so we want to look this morning specifically, I want to look at, at, at uh, this picture of despair uh, that, that, and how Matthew helps us understand it. Um, so we'll start here with this scripture. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So, I mean, Mary and Mary were sitting around in a graveyard staring at a grave. Uh, that's incredibly discouraging. And then the next morning comes and they say, let's go back and look at the grave some more today. And once more they head to the graveyard and they're not looking for Jesus. I mean, they really aren't. They're going to the graveyard. They're not expecting anything out of the ordinary. They are totally hopeless and yet at the same time they're filled with despair and they're going to go watch the grave again for another day. But then the scripture tells us this. At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. I mean, that's the message. That's the hope. Uh, in fact, in many churches on Easter Sunday, uh, the Usually the, 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 the liturgy offered, offered that morning is, He is risen, and, and congregation responds, He is risen indeed. And so that's a little rehearsal for Sunday, so we'll, we'll work on that here in a couple of weeks. But to know that these three words, He has risen, are the reasons, literally, that a billion people gather every weekend to celebrate worship. Why? Those three words, Christ is risen. Those three words separate Jesus from every other religious leader in the history of the world. You pick any religious leader in the, in the history, literally, Moses, Joseph Smith, Muhammad, L. Ron Hubbard, they are all have one thing in common. You can go to the grave. You literally can go to the grave where they are, reside. They're still there. But you see, you go to Jesus' grave, and he is not there. Why? Because he is risen. So what is it about those three words that give people of every generation of hope? People have not gathered for 2,000 years and said, the stock market has risen. It's risen indeed. Has it? No. Uh, people have not gathered to say, the employment rate has risen, or gross domestic product has risen, or General Motors has risen. We don't greet each other by saying, the value of my 401k plan has risen. No. But people all over the world gather each Easter to proclaim, Christ has risen. And that one fact replaces despair and hope. Because Jesus is risen from the grave, people discover, finally, there's something that you can count on. So, now, why is that a big deal? I mean, think about it. What, what attracts a billion people to church each Sunday? Probably a few less this morning because of the time change, right? Uh, when you're attending a life-giving, God-honoring, Bible-teaching church, the average, average person who walks in, no matter what condition they are in, would say that after they have worshipped the living God, after they've been taught the Bible, after they've spent time singing songs and praises to God, they generally walk out of that space with more hope than they came in with. So, the truth is, when someone gets hope, anything is possible. Uh, the resurrection of Christ fuels hope, and when you get hope, anything is possible in your life, in your marriage, with your kids, with your future. If you have hope, anything is possible. But without hope, it doesn't matter what you have because nothing is possible. So you see, these women, as we just saw in the scriptures, they, they walk into a tomb hopeless, filled with despair, and they heard news that Christ was risen. And they walked away with hope. And right then, anything became possible for these women. So Matthew says, because of Christ's resurrection, you too can come back from, come back from despair. Now let's look at and Mark. Mark is this, that I can come back from defeat. Um, and here, let's look at this a little clip from the living. Simon, do you love me? Yes. You're 
That's amazing to me. The angel is announcing that Jesus is alive and wants to meet with the disciples. The angel tells him very clearly, go to tell his disciples. And then I actually think the next two words are the game changer, and Peter. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, and I think many times I was pushing through preparing for this message. I was like, wow, I've read that I don't know how many times. I completely missed it. So here's the point. What Mark is saying is that Christ's resurrection means that your past, no matter what it is, is not unforgivable. You cannot walk so far away from God that he cannot reach you. And that's important for us to understand. Okay, third, third person. We're going to look at Luke here. What does Luke do? Well, remember, he's a physician. And he's writing the Greeks. And he says simply this, I can't come back from doubt. And just as you can bounce back from despair and defeat, you can also bounce back, come back from those moments when we doubt. Luke is, is writing to a very mind, kind of cerebral kind of people. He was writing to, to people who think, to skeptics. And, and so this, this, these two verses sort of popped out. The first one being, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Some of us are wired to be skeptical. If this, is your, if this would be your first time into a church, you might be surprised to find that there are people sitting all around you who were once atheists, agnostics, and other religions. Talking to some of you yesterday, we were mindful of uh, the celebration of life that was in California for, for former First Lady Nancy Reagan. And it was just interesting hearing the tension of conversation between the many of the presenters, but even uh, her, one of her own family members, uh, her son, who, by his own admission, is, is an atheist. But, you know, in those moments, and, and that's why the church matters in so many different ways of offering people strength, is that sometimes life, I mean, if you think about growing up in that, that culture, you know, if you were, I mean, if you just look at the audience, uh, the Tom Selleck's and the James Baker's and, and people of power and presence, and, and if you're raising a young family in that, uh, you know, if you're the governor of California and you're trying to lead, you know, I think it takes an extraordinary person to lead politically. And usually the fallout in that is the family uh, because there's so much demand on their time. And so it may be that, that Ronnie's, uh, the, net, the messiness of his journey right now is the fact that, that he has some things that he hasn't been able to bring closure to. And we need to pray for him. So it's interesting that, that in this time that Luke is writing to these people who think and he wants to help them see. Uh, and we also need, I'll remind you that actually we're pretty sure that Luke wrote uh, uh, actually a sequel. It's called the, the Book of Acts, Acts of the Gospels, or the Apostles. In it, he, he talks a lot about how he mentions actually in chapter 1, verse 3, uh, Luke writes, after his suffering, Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And after Jesus' suffering, he, he did what? He gave many convincing proofs. And that's actually just uh, this idea that these things matter. Again, that we have a historical faith. And that's why even like last week when Dr. Walter was here to share. That there's things about who we are and what we say we believe that's not just fabricated. It actually is grounded in history. Uh, but this is the second verse here, too. He said to them, that is why I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of prophets, of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And that's why last week I gave you just, a, just 24 prophecies that sort of nail very distinctly that, that Jesus, his life, his, his life, his death, his resurrection were all foretold in many different ways in the scriptures. And so it's important that we see that word fulfilled. So I want you to see that last sentence there where it says everything is, must be fulfilled. You might want to circle that because see, it really hangs on that. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Because um, a little bit of unpacking that, and that's why, again, I was glad Dr. Waltham was here. Because, you see, we are Christians for two reasons. One, because it's true. And two, because it works. So what is true? And, and that's what I love about our faith is uh, this is... Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the books, the book of Isaiah. And what's extraordinary is that um, the Old Testament, which was written probably at least the parts about Christ more than 450 years before his coming, actually talked about his death and crucifixion. And so what's stunning about the Old Testament is that, and, and I don't have this in your worship notes, but you might want to look at this later, but write this down in Psalm 22 and write down Isaiah 53. Those are Old Testament books. And uh, 
And I want you to look at those because, in particular, Isaiah 53 is really interesting because it actually describes in detail the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God. And, you know, what's really more amazing is when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually, in 1947, and that was actually just this happenstance, and literally a shepherd boy was tossing stones up into a hole in the side of a mountain there in the desert, somewhere in the Middle East, and he, all of a sudden the stone he threw broke something, a clay pot. And so they subsequently went up and did some investigation and actually found these amazing jars that had scrolls in them. Now the cool thing about that is that actually the scrolls they found, some of them were in the book of Isaiah, they're actually older copies of them what we currently have. And so it was, it was extraordinary to discover because what was allowed to take place was simply this, is that once they began to read, because that's always the question, you know, did the, the disciples sort of, did they just conjure this thing up? And they, did they get the historians to sort of rewrite history? And the truth is that even the, the manuscripts that we had found, our Bibles have been based on for literally decades, they, we found older manuscripts, and those manuscripts actually confirmed and actually were identical to what we already have, which shows you whole conversation we can have with our, you know, our friends Dr. Byron or, or Dr. Walther or others about the integrity of the scriptures, the fact that this book that we believe in, this book that we read and we center our life around, that it's true. And so if it's true, then in these moments, whether we're pushing through de de defeat or despair or doubt, is that we know that God's going to show up. So that's just something I, I want us to hold on to. And, and particularly in our tradition as Presbyterians, I think it's something that is deeply seated in, in what we view about history and about how God works. And then this final point is that about the book of John. John says basically, I come back from death. So finally, because of the resurrection, I come back from death itself. I mean, there's another old joke. Three guys are sitting around talking about their funerals, what they want said at their funerals. And the first guy says, I want them to say, you know, he was a great guy. And the second guy says, well, you know what I want is I want them to say that he was a wonderful husband and a great dad. And the third guy says, you know what I want? I'll tell you what I really want. I want them to say, hey, look, he's moving. <laughs> you know, that he hasn't died. Because, you see, how does life after death work? I mean, we sort of push through that. And I'll be very honest. Uh, you know, I, I was a little apprehensive about this journey with Glenn because I've been in the context of that uh, in, in a couple different ways, but it's always been in family and in friends situations where we, we're usually going to the funeral home. And so actually being responsible as, as a pastor and as a, a shepherd to walk with that family and to know that I was going to get the phone call first to come and, and be with him. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to handle that. And so I was grateful that the timing was when our men were here for men's study. And then we together went as the church on behalf of you to hear stories and to pray with uh, Glenn's family. And uh, there was a peace there for me, uh, part of my growing edge of, of leading this way. Uh, I've been in homes where we're after the fact, but never there moments after someone passes. And so I, I'm humbled by that and grateful that you've entrusted me that, that kind of opportunity. Because you see, we go to the scripture from Jesus, where Jesus says simply this. He says this to, to, to us today. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And the question is for us, do we believe that? So in other words, Jesus was saying that if you are connected to him, because he rose from the dead, you will rise. Because he lives forever, you will live forever. If we're connected to him. And that's the important part, and that's why we've spent you know, four weeks looking at this movie that's out in the theater, is to be reminded, and, and again, I can't say what a great opportunity it would be for you to invite a friend who's maybe unchurched, or someone who hasn't been in church for a while, to go and engage at that level, because it really does bring to light, uh, in a very uh, beautiful way, the story and the power of the resurrection. And, and so I don't know how you've thought about death. I, I know our culture doesn't really think about death much. I mean, um, and, and I've said to you all this, that the one thing we all share in this room, uh, young and old, is that, that death is part of our journey. But Jesus tells us we don't have to fear that. 
Because see, there is this heaven, and there is this risen Savior, and it's real. Because it's real, it's something that we can hang on to. And so John was writing to everyone, and he focused on Jesus' divinity, that he really is who he says he is. And, and we know John says near the end of his gospel, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus was showing all of us what believing in him really means, that we will all have an opportunity for life after death, and that's why it matters. That's why it matters. Now there's this confident assurance that we all need to have. And as I wrap up, just to point to this, that this is your life, that they, may, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So think about it. There are sort of two sides to this message. On the one side, we've talked about despair, defeat, doubt, and death. But the other side is the idea that there is life. And I think that's really why there is such contentiousness in our political order right now, in our economic order, and even in the world order. And that why it doesn't feel right is because people are looking for answers. And that's where I was even reminded as we wrapped up yesterday. And a couple of folks who had come to visit Glenn mentioned, and to visit with the family, mentioned that, you know, in sort of an apologetic way, that they, they hadn't lived their lives very well. And so my challenge to them, and it's simply my challenge to you this morning in the same way, how do we allow our lives to be impacted by the truth of that? Because now that, that Glenn is no longer at that back door, is no longer serving in the life of the church, and the stories we heard about how he invested in the lives of others around him, then it really means it's our responsibility. And it's our duty. And our, more than duty, our amazing opportunity to step in and lead in that way. People today are filled with despair at levels that we've never seen before, I would suggest. People feel defeated. They are racked with doubt. And I know many of you don't really believe that you have something to offer others. And that you're fearful in some regards of sharing your faith or inviting people to be part of this larger story. And that's why we push into this conversation. Uh, you don't have to live a life, a life of defeat. You don't have to live a life of despair. There is hope and there is all many things that we can experience together by knowing who Jesus is. But you can know that your future is secure because of the truth of the resurrection. Otherwise, as I said, I said a couple weeks ago, that you know, if we don't have the truth of the resurrection, then our faith is in vain. So, let's pray. And as you close your eyes and as you uh, shut out the world around you, I want you to hear these words again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so this morning, it would be a shame not to allow the truth of the resurrection to impact you in that way. So no matter how you may have come into the building this morning, or where you've been this week, or even where your life has been, um, let, let's just pray together. God, we, we thank you. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. We, we believe that Jesus was who he said he was, and proved it by raising from the dead. Jesus, I, I pray that each of us would want to discover and begin following your plan in a new and a purposeful way, even today. That though our journey may have been decades old, that we may find it new and fresh as we lean into this time of Easter one more time, of where we hang on to the truth that you have risen, and we live our lives in the context of that. Jesus, we, we receive all that you offer us as your people this morning. Thank you for the life of, it, of life itself uh, that we can enjoy each day. But we pray that our lives would matter to those that we have come in contact with. So, so go with us today as we reach out to others and love them with your love. We just thank you for that privilege, Jesus. And it's by your blood and by your power and by your presence in our lives today that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.